separated your deep ball from everybody else? My deep ball, it has a little secret sauce to it, man. <laughs> uh, never get too high, never get too low, but just keep moving. The, the whole story is Carlos never beat me in any kind of sports in, in, in high school. Welcome to the Orange is the No Black Podcast. I'm your host, Ace Boogie, joined by my co-host, Zim. Zim, say what's up. What's up, world? How y'all doing? Free agency frenzy is going on. Cash app on deck from the Bengals front office. We got the money. We got the cap space. We making the moves, and they mad. How That's do you fast. feel? How do you feel about this free agency so far, Ace? Well, we're going to talk about the release of G- Geno Atkins. We'll be talking about the second wave of free agency, and if we have some time, we'll probably talk about the free agents that are available. Uh, but first, let's get into Geno Atkins. So. The eight-time Pro Bowler Geno Atkins was released. He gives us a cap savings of nine and a half million. He was a three-team first team all three time. I'm sorry, first team all pro 2012, 2015, 2016, second team all pro in 2011, 2010 all decade team. I mean, this guy is a future Hall of Famer. Uh, fourth round pick in 2010, 120, uh, 384 tackles, 75 and a half sacks. Six pass deflections, eight forced fumbles, two fumble recoveries, and even one defensive touchdown. Zen, what does Geno Atkins mean to you? Geno Atkins is the leader of the the three-tech mafia. Like, you know, like you could ask Aaron Donald. And matter of fact, there's a a good interview where Aaron Donald's getting interviewed by some kid at like a cafeteria or something. And it was like, who do you look up to? And he's like, Geno Atkins, you know. So Geno Atkins is like, you know, if there – before Geno Atkins – from that position, there's a big, large stream of nose tackles in this league, and a lot of guys that weren't, you know, in this three tech position. And Geno Atkins opened up the door for that. It also opened up the door for drafting uh, players of that profile because before Geno, there was very few players that were getting drafted at that at that size. Like you know, they were going six two and up, like you know, like big. Uh, more lankier guys or whatever like but he brought on the beef <laughs> you know what I'm saying like Arby's up front but at the same time being able to put pressure on the quarterback and bringing that pressure right in your lap Geno Atkins is 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 a legend <laughs> like make no start no no and ifs or buts about it and it's crazy to just watch this happen before our eyes you know like we're living in the, you know, like the changing of the guards. Like this is history. Like twenty years from now, ten years from now, they were like, bro, like AJ Green, Geno Atkins left the same all season. Like we are watching like an extreme like takeover right in front of our eyes. And Geno Atkins, it, it feels so surreal because we're so in the mix of free agency that I don't think people are really like, you know, it hasn't really hit them. You know, this past season, Geno was hampered with the shoulder injury. So when you look at it, you know, I think. I always say football is almost like show business. It's, you're not as big as your last hit. You know, like whatever your biggest hit was, is that's, that's how people remember you. And so maybe the impact of him not having a huge year this past year has softened the blow. But Geno Atkins is 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 a legend. Yeah, definitely. Geno Atkins is a legend. I told a, a story about AJ last week with my first interaction with him and what that meant. I also have a Geno story. So like back in the day, People used to play NCAA football. I'm glad that they're bringing it back, right? And on there, I remember always wanting to take this guy, Geno Atkins, out of Georgia. Like, I was always on the game trying to add him to the NFL team because back then you could take the players from NCAA and put them into Madden. And anytime you did that, like Geno Atkins, from from what I remember, he was always like a first-round pick, but he was, like, different. His athletic build was different and stuff like that. And so when I remember watching the draft and getting into it, I couldn't understand why he wasn't a first round pick. I was like, this dude was amazing at Georgia. And then I was reminded, as you said, of his size was the issue. And so when we drafted him, I was like, oh, that's dope. That's the dude that I used to get off of the NCAA game all the time. And like you said, he just revolutionized the position. You know, it would for me, it wasn't anyone since the, the John Randall's and the Warren Saps of the world that were putting up those kind of sack numbers. And that's what he represented to me. And that's why he will, in my opinion, be a first ballot Hall of Famer because it's a defensive tackle to have that many sacks. You can't deny those numbers. And so, like you said, a legend uh, battled some injuries last season. Like you said, you're only as good as your last hit, but definitely a salute to Geno Atkins, the legend. So is he done? Is he done? Nah, I think Geno can play. If I had to. Will we regret it? 
Will we regret it? Not necessarily. Like it really depends on what they're doing. And I think, I think with the changing of the guard, you talked about AJ Green and walking away from Geno Atkins. That literally is a transition to me of officially admitting that this is a rebuild. Like you're getting rid of marquee players from that Marvin Lewis era, from the 2010 era. That is essentially putting the wrap on it. First, it was Carlos Dunlap. Second, it was AJ Green. Now it's Geno Atkins. Like, this is the dawn of a new era. It's official that we're rebuilding. They're getting their guys in. I think he still has stuff left in the tank. I think he could probably still play two years. Would love to see him try to go out and get a Super Bowl. And he's well respected around the league. So, yeah, I think he's still got something left in the tank, especially with him coming off that injury. From what I heard, not sure if this was 100% or not, but he was waived with like an injury, like he failed the physical or something like right. that. So I hope that he just is able to heal because obviously he did play with basically one one arm last year. So I just hope that he's able to get 100% healthy. But, yeah, I do think that he does have at least one season, two seasons left in the tank. You look around the league, you see what Ndamukong Su did for the Bucks. I think that Geno could do something similar to what he did for a contender. Right. I, I agree. So moving into the next way, we had a bunch of moves happen, bro. I'm just going to go ahead and read off this list that I have here. Ricardo Allen signed Ooh. today as we're recording this. This is Wednesday. Uh, they signed Ricardo Allen to a one-year deal. He's a safety. Eli Apple signed a one-year deal the day before. Ooh. Corner. Uh, Quentin Spain come, came back as well for Great that plan. intentionally left guard position. Kevin Huber, we have our punter back. Ryan yes, Finley was traded to Houston okay. from Cincinnati okay. uh, with the seventh round pick that we gave up for their sixth round pick, which is oh. actually which actually belongs to Miami, and also the number 202 pick. So they get to move up a full mm -hmm. round with that just by moving on from Ryan Finley, a.k.a. Okay. Vanilla Vic. Riley Sick. Reef, one of the biggest signers of the week, one year, seven and a half million. Five and a half million, I believe, guaranteed. Bobby Hart was cut, so that's five point eight million off the books. Mike Thomas was re-signed. Larry Ogan Joby, the defensive tackle from Cleveland, signed for one year, six point four million. And then we also had Ryan Kerrigan, who's actually visiting as we were recording this pod as well today. And Eason, and, and Eason as well. Eason was also a visit the center. So the Bengals really attacking this line. Zim, just what are your thoughts on? what they've done with all of these transactions. They said they weren't done after that first day. They clearly are not done. Where do I begin? Like, you know, this the craziest thing about this to me is like as you're as you're rattling that off just now, I'm thinking like in any other year, we would have spent the whole episode on maybe one of those moves. Just Bobby Hart being cut is a whole <laughs> episode, right? Right. Or or Riley Reef signing. That's a whole episode. We're making so many moves that it's just like it's almost like as a you know as a content creator or whatever you want to call us you know it's it's hard to keep up with it one thing i will say is that a lot of these pieces to me signal one thing is that they learn from the what i was saying you you know like last off season when i kept on saying bro we have to just stack it up and just have a lot of depth you cannot count on a guy to just be available in his league with the injuries that come at, at the level that they do um you better have all hands on deck and you better have a bunch of people up because when they, when the people that say next man up, what happens when your next man up isn't Ricardo Allen? You know, like that is now, you know, slotted to be your backup safety who's been starting for the last six, seven years for the Falcons, you know? So like when you're talking about depth in that regard or some of these signings like that, it is, it is amazing to see because I can see that working because, some of those games that we lost that are super, super close, I look at some of those rock like some of like the Browns will have all the bragging rights in the world, and I'll be the last person to bring up injuries. But everybody knows that that secondary when we played them in that, that on that second time that we played them was absolute like in shambles. I didn't even like when they were suiting up that day, they had guys coming off the practice squad I had never even heard of, and I follow the Bengals every day of my life. So to now have so much depth where we're now talking about Darius Phillips is probably like your fourth, fifth corner. So now who I've been saying this for the last couple of years, I believe that Darius Phillips is the best punt returner in the national football league. And if you're going to have all of these guys like Eli Apple is, a, is now your backup corner, 
uh, now you're freeing up the ability where the team couldn't take the risk of having Darius Phillips uh, go down with an injury with so what was I mean, they, they were coming to the weeks with like three guys. So, right. you know, you couldn't have them returning kicks, you know, but now you, you open up that ability. You know that if, if it all falls down, you know, you can um count on Darius Phillips to go up against the ones against anybody. So I just love some of the depth moves. The Riley Reef pick, uh, I'm, I'm sorry, not pick, but the Riley Reef signing to me is a big one because I feel as though he's still at a, at a, uh, he's probably, he's past his prime, but he's still good enough. And he's still a big upgrade from Bob Hart. And he's still at this level where I think Mr. Offensive Line guy, Mr. Trenches guy is satisfied with him. And to me, it's not, it's no longer looked at as a detriment to the team to suit a guy up at that position, no matter what you do. It doesn't change what I go into the draft. These are all the things that I've been preaching all along. You go into the draft and you go on BPA if you do everything that you have to do in free agency. We're going to get into maybe at the end of the show or guys that maybe they should still pick up so that you can have the full board on deck. Riley Reef doesn't change the fact that if Panay Suel is right there in your face and, you know, some of the guys that I like maybe are gone or however the Bengals haven't ranked. I'm not here to scout. I'm here to tell you who I like and I in and, and a plan. If Riley Reef is your starting right tackle and Jonah Williams is your starting left tackle, you are not forced to pick anybody or reach on anything. I have the luxury of trading down and seeing a Slater falls there. If I don't, then, you know, maybe I go and get AVT, um, you know, like later, you know, later in a round in the trade back scenario. There's so many different things you could do now just by that one guy. Quentin Spain now shores it up too, where, okay. Maybe the guys that I want, like a Trey Turner or a Walford, who I want to start at right guard, we don't get them. You go into the draft and you have a plan. Maybe you don't get them. Or maybe you do go get the guy that I feel could start day one. Doesn't matter. You know that. Say he doesn't hit the ground running. I know I got Quentin Spain that's more than legit, more than uh, more than um, sufficient enough to play the position, and he can step right in. So anybody that says that these signings aren't, overwhelming or they, they're not you know like looking at them like they're tier one guys that's cool i'm with you i agree these are not elite you know linemen or elite uh corners and stuff but what it does is bolster up a room so that you're not scrambling when you get to games that, that are there to be had i want to take this moment to say please like and subscribe our pod you guys have been so amazing watching us throughout this year and a half or so or how long me and ace have been doing this please make sure you take this time out to like and subscribe um ace did you have anything from yeah the only thing that i also want to talk about is uh we have a new uh sponsor for the show is lfg sensi so please be sure to check out our codes they're going to be in the youtube description for me and zim's video please be sure to subscribe to his YouTube channel, Zim Hude and mine, New Stripe City. You can find that in the description. We'll also be posting those links on Twitter. So follow us on Twitter at New Stripe City and at Zim Hude. And we're going to post all kinds of stuff because this is dirt, dope merch. And please be sure to enter your code Zim at checkout and Ace at checkout. That helps us and that helps support us. That helps support Cincinnati. And we'll be having and, and showing some dope uh, gear. Zim, there was something that you wanted to add. I want to say LFG. A lot of people ask me. I did a promo run for them about a month ago where cool guys, Cincinnati guys. I want to emphasize that Cincinnati guys. We're working with people that are in the city that are locked in and love the team. They absolutely love the team. The prices on the merchandise that they have, the designs that they have on the merchandise are top tier Fire. i, I Fire. love i love their designs if you check them out they also bought a new van <laughs> that they're going to be tailgating at paul brown this upcoming year so they're really really excited about that but lfg since please don't just go to the website it's very important that you follow our link get unique savings and really really unique like merch that nobody else is going to have for a fraction of the price Right. It really helps support us if you do use those custom links. If not, then you will not be supporting us, but supporting LFG Sensi. But that's dope anyway. But yeah, please, if you can, <laughs> if you don't mind, it helps me and Zim grow our bases and do these shows and, and make these shows and shows like this better. Uh, so I'm just going to respond to some of those free agency moves. 
it was a crazy – it's been like a crazy free agency for us, right? We, we're we used to the Bengals not really being huge players. We thought last year was, was something crazy. This year is even more because when you talk about some of the other things that have happened, they're releasing players pretty fast, clearing out that cap space like we wanted. They're also being linked to big stars like Kenny Galladay, like things that are happening that we just were like, wow, this is like insane. So to hear that the Galladay. Joe Burrow effect, Gala Day for sure. The Joe Burrow effect was real. Uh, they contacted the Bengals to see about a one year deal. He ultimately speak, ended speak, up. Speak signing. about that. Speak about that though. Do you do, mm-hmm. were were you one of the people that were hashtag Gala Day? And how do you feel about it now seeing the details of the Gala Day deal? Oh, I, w- I mean, I was down with it. Anytime you can add a player like that, I'm down. You know, it wasn't my initial. Like, I didn't even think that that was that had a chance of happening initially heading into free agency. Like, if you would have told me, Ace, we can go and get Kenny Galladay, I'm like, nah, there's no there's no way that we were going to do that. But to me, I wanted it to happen. I'm not mad that it didn't happen. I'm just happy that at least it was reported that the Bengals like made an effort to try to get him. So for him to get 19 million was just kind of insane. So uh, for me, I think that it was it was still something um that was impressive for the Bengals to to be involved in. So for me that that's what I'd probably say about Kenny Galladay. He goes to the Giants, but you know, it's the Giants. Like how are you gonna pick Danny Dimes over Joe Burrow? But I guess money but, but 18, over everything 18, is what 18, matters. 18.5 million. So me chase at five. I want to get Jamar like a fraction. Like think about this. Potentially Jamar Chase is going to be Potentially a Galladay level prospect is what I what I assume if right. you're taking them that high. But you, I don't think people know the money aspects of that is a fraction of what Galladay is going to get. Eighteen point mm-hmm. five. I thought that wasn't even out there in the market for him. He yeah, got that it. was that was kind of wild that he still was able to get it. But with his injury of, history, which is crazy. Yeah, he like barely played last season? season. He barely played last season. So I'm glad that the Bengals weren't offering him that much money and guaranteeing it. Uh, but back to the second wave, I think, like you said, Ricardo Allen, a very solid safety that, that they can bring in. And Eli Apple, another corner that, you know, isn't the best corner as far as a starter or anything like that. But like you said, when we had a lot of corners go down, and Darius Phillips included, no shot at him or anything, but this has been the second year that he's kind of struggled to stay on the field, and that's kind of put us in a bad spot. Now this puts us in a spot where you can bring a guy like Eli Apple, who may not be the best corner, but at least has started an NFL game before and has experience on the outside and the inside. So I love that signing as far as depth because he's, like you said, our fifth corner. You talk about Quentin Spain solidifying that guard position. I'm not a huge Quentin Spain fan, but he's better than anything we had at guard. I love how he fights in the trenches for sure. He has that aggressiveness about him that a lot of the Bengals players on that offensive line didn't have. So I love that they're bringing him back on a one-year prove-it deal. Prove me wrong that you are the left guard for the Cincinnati Bengals. I love that. Kevin Huber bringing him back makes sense. I love the Ryan Finley trade to go ahead and move up one round. The Bengals are making moves before that because to me, a seventh-round draft pick probably isn't going to make it. But a sixth-round pick Our early six-round pick could be a guy that fell from the fourth, fifth, or something like that to the top of the sixth round. So I love that move. Riley Reef bolstering that right side of the offensive line was key. It's major. Like like Zim said, you don't have to be particularly locked into taking a tackle in the first round with that pick. Now, where he's going to play, it seems like right tackle. He's also talked about he'd be flexible with moving the guard. So would love to see what they're going to do there. But the thing about it is I went on to a Ravens or not a Ravens, but a a Vikings podcast. And they said that this guy is not amazing, but he's like the definition of average, which is pretty good, right? You get the 16th or 17th ranked tackle in the NFL. That's way better than having the 32nd or the 35th ranked tackle. So he just brings a lot of security there and they get him on a steal because this guy was making about 10 million a year. Uh, with the Vikings. And the reason that he left there was because last season at the beginning, they made him take a $5 million pay cut. And then he was upset because they traded for Yannick Ngakwe and paid him or just basically to get that money. And then they came to him again this season after he had a good season and said, hey, we want you to take another $5 million pay cut. And Riley Reef was like, nah, just, just go ahead and cut me. So this was an amazing deal for the Bengals to get him for that number. You also talk about the release of Bobby Hart. Essentially, you're just paying him about 
two more million if everything is fully guaranteed. So that's not even bad at all. It's essentially you're paying Bobby Hart money for Riley Reef with that 5.5 guarantee. Really, you're paying 300 less for that. So essentially, you get that. Then you talk about Mike Thomas. I'm not mad at that. I'm not sure if he's a guy that's going to be a lot to make the roster. But with you only having three wide receivers at the time, it makes sense to add a fifth, actually, because they still have Stanley Morgan Jr. as well. And then Ryan Kerrigan is in for a visit this week. So they went hard on the trenches. I'd love to see what Ryan Kerrigan can bring to this team. You already went out, and Zim talked about this. You already got one edge rusher. He talked about this last week. You got one edge rusher last week in Hendrickson. Now you're bringing in Kerrigan to be another guy to add to that defensive line. This is a guy that had the same number of sacks as Carl Lawson last year. He's got some wisdom. He can help guys like Khalid Kareem grow and give them insight. And then you just put a whole bunch of depth on that position, which you really didn't have with the losses of Carlos Dunlap, Carl Lawson, and guys like that. Now you have two guys that are in there. You got Sam Hubbard that's still there. You got Khalil Kareem that's still there. Now you're not probably going to have to keep Armani Bledsoe out there on random downs. So no no shade to him or anything like that, but you got some more guys there that can do something. And then Larry Ogunjobi, I love this move too. Some people might feel like this may have been – the fact that they overpay for him, but he has a ton of potential athletic guy out of North Carolina. I believe it's a smaller school, uh, but uh, he was one of my draft favorites back then just because he's an athletic freak. This is a guy that's huge, but has a six pack. He'll make all these crazy moves. He's replacing Gino. Do he you, was, go ahead. Do, do you, on your AFC North show, what do you, what is the, what do the Browns guys feel about him? Because I was right. talking to a Browns guy earlier today. They were mm-hmm. saying that they felt like they were playing him out of uh, out of position. This they past definitely year. played him out of position because they played him at the nose tackle. He's really a three technique. Uh, he's a guy that's a sack artist. That's why he's replacing Geno. He had five and a half sacks, uh, I think, in 2019. Two and a half sacks last year, but it was a down year for him. He's extremely athletic. What I heard though is that he shows and flashes a bunch of potential on uh, pass rushdowns but they have questions about him on early downs. Like it's, they said that they don't, they're not sure if he can be a three down tackle, but he is extremely talented. That's why Gino kind of took him under his wing. And I think this is the perfect situation for him, right? He's finally, and he seemed happy to not be playing as a nose tackle. And he's going to be playing as that three technique. And I think he's going to be happy to be able to unleash some of his talents. And it's on a one year prove it deal. So his back is up against the wall. He can't be lacking or anything like that. So, all of these moves, overall, I love, and I can't wait to see what the Bengals do going forward. And that brings us to the remaining free agents. So, Zim, what are your thoughts on the guys that are still left out there? I can't hear you. I had one thought because you were talking about Riley Reef versus Bob Park. I just want to put this into perspective for anybody that's poo-pooing the high idea that Riley Reef isn't legit. 1,000 slaps, snaps this past year, only one snap, I mean, only one sack allowed. Only 21 pressures allowed. Only one penalty the whole entire year for $7.5 million. In, in in comparison, Bobby Hart, 872 snaps. So that's less snaps. Allowed four sacks, which is not terrible, but just goes to show you. Pressures allowed double, 44. Penalties, three. And damn near the same money. Right. Upgrade. I want to talk about the new guys. Somebody else that you think that the guys I, I named myself Zim Cash App who they because I feel like the Bengals have a cash app balance <laughs> and the money's just sitting right there. And if you got some, if you can ball like a Ricardo, I thought Ricardo Allen, like I don't know, but if you can ball or you show <laughs> you can ball in the past, then they got their cash app ready. So cash right. app ready right now. Who is the first guy we could we're gonna count to three. Who is the first guy that the guy and you're going to say his first name? Counter to three. Who is the first guy the Bengals should sign? And you probably be okay with them just ending the whole entire free agency. One, two, three. Trey. Ryan. <laughs> <laughs> I knew you were going to say Trey. I didn't want to say Trey too at the same time. I, I would just say Ryan Kerrigan just because of I think he solidifies that edge the edge for us. And when I look at the edge class, I'm not impressed by it. Like there's some guys in there, but there's not a guy that I feel like can come in and, and be abreast to the defense and come in and make the impact of a veteran like Ryan Kerrigan. So I would just say him because I don't think, even though you said like, maybe they might be done. I don't think that they'll be done. I think he'll be cheap and, you know, 31, possibly turning 32 or he might be 32 now. 
I think turning 33, I don't think that he's going to demand that much money, but I would love his presence in the locker room and to be able to groom some of those defense alignments. So I, it would be Ryan Kerrigan for me, but you said Trey Turner, which I also would love as well. So go ahead and talk about Trey. Trey Turner for me is a five-time Pro Bowler, right? Uh, people think that Trey Turner, for whatever reason, because he had a down year with the injuries or something, is like, a shell of himself or something like that. And I'm here to tell you, like, nah, no. like he's here. I like he he is there to be had. He's recognized us on social media with the who tray. He's recognized and like the two tweets that I've seen in reference to him being a Bengal. So he's he he knows that the Bengals need that. Quentin Spain doesn't scream. This is our starting guard, and neither does Xavier Sulafilo. If I'm Trey Turner, I'm thinking I want to – what did, uh, what did Awuzie say? He said, I want to be a part of something special. I think when a lot of guys uh, – like a lot of Bengals fans that are thinking, oh, the Bengals will never sign that. Those guys have, have completely gone silent on Twitter to me. <laughs> I, I want to point that out because before, a week or two ago, I tweeted you. I said, remember that we were here in the same spot last year, Ace, and I had to talk a lot of people off the ledge. This year, a lot of people still were on that ledge. Like, no, they're not going to sign anybody. But I want to tell y'all, players talk. And it, they don't think about whatever happened in the past. And if I'm Trey Turner, I'm looking at Joe Burrow. I'm looking at how aggressive all these guys are. I'm looking at the team with the most cap space. And I'm looking at, a, a like, I mean, they're doing deals with voided years. You know, like for a Riley Reef and stuff like that to mm. to free up cap space for this current year. So if I'm Trey Turner, I'll say, where can I go where I'm going to start? Um, I got battle Quentin Spain. Or, like, you know, like it's not even a battle. Like, you know, you would go into the room and say, look, I I'm here to be the starting right guard. And I think, you know, the Bengals would be all for it at the right price. I can't see a reason why it wouldn't be. And for me, I talked about this earlier in the show. You put Trey Turner on here, and, I, and I, I'll just throw Larry Walford in there, too. You throw those two – any one of those guys out there, I'm talking about we will be going to the draft. What we, we did exactly what you're supposed to do in free agency. We went and filled every single hole that the team had. You might don't like the, the coverage. I feel like lessened. I feel like the athleticism with the pass rushers. That's the only thing I will say about the um, – uh, about Ryan Kerrigan, you're getting Ryan Kerrigan, Sam Hugger, Sam Hubbard, and uh, H and, and Hendrickson, right? All three motor guys. You're lo you lost a lot of athleticism and just freak, freak of nature type guys. When Dunlap walked out the door, Geno's now walking out the door, and Carl Lawson walked out the door. So I do see the drop off in that, but I can see by committee these mo high motor guys late in games and close games. With Joe Burrow at the helm, right? Close games because right. Joe Burrow is going to put points on the board in pass rush situations, wearing offensive linemen down. I do love that part of it. The other part of me goes back to my list, and it's a character issue guy, and it's Alden Smith. We have yet to see this staff pick anybody with a with any type of background, character, whatever. And those are the things that Marvin Lewis feasted on in his regime. I'm not saying let's go, uh, go, go sign rapists I'm, or or anybody that's committed crimes. I'm just saying people that have cleaned up their eye, they cleaned up their life or cleaned up their act, and have, he just proved for a whole year you didn't hear a, 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 a peep from him. Alden Smith is a guy with a tremendous athleticism that I would love to have to complete that room so that you can't game plan for these guys. And the same thing happens when I'm talking about Trey Turner. I could go into the draft and draft any position that I want. I could trade out of the pick. I can go get a corner. I could do whatever the heck I want. And that's why I'm really for Trey Turner and Alden Smith, and I'd be done with free agency. I'll say we're, we're finished. Wrap it up. Right. So thank you guys for watching the Orange is the New Black podcast, the home of the diehard Bengals fans. Make sure to tune in next Thursday at 5 p.m. when we'll have on Malik Wright on the show, the guy that's been dropping the bombs all over. But that is going to do it. And we're going to end you guys with a yes. Sersky. Hello, world. What separated your deep ball from everybody else? My deep ball, it has a little secret sauce to it, man. <laughs> I never get too high, never get too low, but just keep moving. The, the whole story is Carlos never beat me in any kind of sports in, in, in high school.